the treatment is kind of new and novel to us because when we were building in the 50s, nobody cared what they hooked up to. So we've had, we've removed over a thousand connections to storm drains where people every day simply flush their toilets and it went in the nearest pipe. If that happened to be a storm drain, that's what it was. Some of the technological things we're looking there is where we're going to be working with a company to pull uh, lines up the line and tell us where the illegal connections are. See where the change of temperature is. Because right now we have this labor intensive thing of knocking on your door, asking us if we can put a little dye in the toilet to see if it shows up in the storm drain, <coughs> and then we send you a violation notice telling you to fix it. <laughs> <laughs> so that works good for the first guy you grab. <laughs> So why do we care about water? You're probably wondering why does the Mass Clean Energy Center care about water? Well, we care about water for a number of different reasons, but I'll highlight just one to get us going, and that is the water energy nexus, which uh, Vanessa referenced. And I'm sure that a lot of you are aware of that already, but just to kind of summarize it very quickly, I think the easiest way to think of it is it takes a lot of energy to move and process water. It takes a lot of water uh, to generate electricity. Uh, a good rule of thumb, think about Niagara Falls. Everyone's either seen Niagara Falls or seen pictures of Niagara Falls. Imagine the amount of water falling over the falls uh, over the course of 60 seconds a minute. Now triple that. That's the amount of water it takes to generate power from your average uh, electricity generating power plant in the U.S. every minute. Every minute. So there's a lot of water required for energy production. So uh, as we seek to boost clean energy here in the state, in the region, around uh, the nation, and indeed around the globe, uh, we really need to keep, um, uh, we can't lose sight of the water energy nexus. We need to continue to focus on water as we're thinking about clean energy. So that's why we're really happy to sponsor uh, this Smart Cities uh, Smart Water Forum tonight. So let's dive in. So in 2008, um, the globe passed what I think are really two, not the Boston globe, the globe. Um, <laughs> and everyone says you know, the hub is sort of self centered. So. Sure. I'm just talking about the planet. Uh, passed two really remarkable milestones. One, for the first time in history, more than 50% of the population is living in cities. And uh, roughly around that same time, around that same year, the number of connected devices exceeded the number of humans on the planet. By 2050, 70% uh, of the world's, it's estimated, 70% of the world's population uh, will live in cities, and the number of connected devices, whether it be residential, commercial, uh, industrial, Internet of Things, uh, is expected to exceed the population by, by sevenfold. So uh, all these connected devices are generating a lot of data. Uh, for example, Microsoft's 8 million square foot facility uh, generates about 500 million data points every day. Some large jet planes generate uh, about 10 million terabytes of data every 30 minutes of flight. So enormous amounts of data are being generated. So why are we generating all this data and what's happening to it? Well, we're told that properly configured um, uh, connected devices and the systems in which they're playing a role will uh, deliver us the smart grid, will improve the efficiency of our transportation system, might improve human health, and so on. Uh, but what about water? You don't hear about water too much. And like our, our electric grid, uh, our water infrastructure, there are a lot of parallels, right? Our water infrastructure is aging. Uh, it's, it's very gray. It's in need of major investment. Uh, and innovators here in Massachusetts and around the globe are trying to find ways to improve our water infrastructure with a wide range of technologies. And a lot of those technologies are digitally connected. So what what data is being generated? How can utility operators and innovators uh, mine it to generate value, customer and environmental benefits? What regulatory and other barriers must change in order to accelerate this smart water infrastructure? Can we leapfrog our current gray, um, disconnected water infrastructure and, and jump right to a kind of smart, green, efficient um, water infrastructure, whether that be um, drinking water, storm water, wastewater, or all three. And of course, at the end of the day, um, this conversation is ultimately about, uh, it must be about people, right? So these new technologies, these new data sources, um, they're only meaningful insofar as they're enabling uh, the capacity to improve human lives. Um, 
we will deliver, how will we deliver this clean water to um, increasing number of urban dwellers? How will we manage increasing stormwater from severe weather events, which are projected and are already happening? How will we manage wastewater more efficiently and more efficiently <coughs> with a lower environmental footprint? So simply wanted to kind of ground our discussion in some of those um, challenges at a very high level. Um, and now I'm going to ask the panelists, why don't we begin with you, Dave, just to uh, briefly introduce yourself, spend three to four minutes of talking about um, your mission, the organization you work for, uh, and perhaps highlight one project that you're working on that's related to tonight's topics. Okay, good. Um, I'm a faculty member, professor of civil and environmental engineering at University of Massachusetts Amherst. Been there for about a little over 30 years, and I'm very used to talking to groups when I have a PowerPoint presentation in back of me, and I don't. Have, but this, this, it's nice to have a, a, a room full and, and standing room only. This is a little different than my typical uh, uh, classroom, but I do see open seats in the front, and, and that is common uh, everywhere. So if anyone wants to move to, to the front, that, that would be fine. But uh, my my. I was uh, started out as a classical civil engineer, uh, learning how to make concrete, build structures, and I went into the environmental engineering field and slowly recognized that it was changing. It was changing very quickly, and I s became more and more of a chemist than anything else as I moved forward, recognizing that it's your grandfather's water, wastewater treatment plant is not what we have today in some respects. In some respects it is. And so I've been, I've been at UMass since 1985. Um, as Galen said, I'm, I'm director of the Water Innovation Network for Sustainable Small Systems, in addition to being a, a faculty member there. And uh, as such, uh, we have an EPA-funded center, one of two in the country. And our mission is to advance certain technologies in drinking water treatment. <coughs> technologies that are appropriate for small systems, but any technology that can be used by a small system certainly can be used by a larger one too. So uh, we're trying to help those that need the most help, but uh, we're really uh, serving as a national facility. Our, our technologies include a wide range of uh, different topics that run from the more traditional to some of the more advanced, including some, some sensing <coughs> sensor technologies. Uh, also some um, technologies or some ideas around regulatory control as well. Um, in addition, I'm working uh, very much with, with Michael, in fact, and the New England Water Innovation Network. I have my pin right here, and so I promised I would make a, uh, a little pitch for them. Uh, this is the local water cluster uh, that has been forming over the past few years, and uh, they're they're trying to build in the water sector. But one of the one of the ways in which we're helping at UMass is to try to develop a pilot testing facility uh, that is a, a general use facility uh, that can help advance technologies. And so that's that's another piece. But my my background is is more or less the classical environmental engineering. I do a lot of very geeky things at UMass, uh, studying the nuances of natural uh, organic matter and trace contaminants and how to oxidize those trace contaminants. But we ultimately, of course, all want to see some of these products used and use the new technologies that we have. Thanks, Scott. So hi, I'm Scott McCarley, Senior Director of Solution Management at PTC, and I work in our, our ThingWorks group. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with PTC, but it's uh, possibly the, well, no longer, but it's a large a software company in, in Needham, Massachusetts, so about 6,000 people. Uh, comes historically making uh, software for the manufacturing, discrete manufacturing industry, so helping people design, engineer, and manufacture uh, discrete products. Uh, about five years ago, we, we recognized that you know, all of these products are going to be connected and we foresaw that you know, they're, they're going to need software to enable that. We invested heavily in TACT and it's become really the, the main thrust of the company uh, to create an IoT platform for, through acquisition and organic growth. Uh, I work as part of that group and it's ThingWorks is the IoT platform. So um, my focus is uh, as part of the product management team is working uh, in the smart cities market. And we define that pretty broadly as water, energy, transportation, city services like uh, you know, waste removal or, or parking. Um, 
and buildings. So my role might be to understand the challenges that people uh, face in those markets, how our platform and technology can best fit and meet the, the needs to develop solutions, and then ultimately if there are opportunities or gaps to, to feed those into uh, product requirements for, for roadmap. Um, so I've had the pleasure of also working with our partners. We're delivering end solutions for the water market, making smart water solutions. Um, maybe to highlight one, uh, as was requested, and uh, we work with a partner, Aquamatics, who has done some, some really uh, interesting things with our technology and in their own, advancing it. So they have uh, created, I would say, uh, water and wastewater asset and operation management solutions. So uh, providing real-time insight of the performance of assets in a water facility, uh, incidents and operations, uh, factoring or alerting on other you know, external uh, conditions such as weather, and providing also the ability to control based upon uh, you know, the information receiving, so controlling whether it's the valves or pumps. Um, it's been a, uh, working with customers and customers like Veolia uh, Water, so that you know, in, in a water treatment facility, which typically or tended to have a big central control. Uh, they could now alert people outside of it, create a much more distributed system. So a great, you know, gaining real new operations advances. And maybe in the interest of time, I'll just mention there's an uh, exciting additional project with them that I think they would be, you know, would love to discuss, which is around uh, building uh, water recycling. So working with a uh, equipment or plant uh, delivery in, inside of a treatment, water treatment inside of a building. So, but also providing the solution software so that you can monitor it and, and service it. And essentially make it a, uh, economically feasible to operate it so that one person could you know, uh, service over 200 of these in, in buildings around so that you could reclaim uh, rainwater, uh, gray water, put those back, use it for irrigation of the of plants um, and the toilet water. So you know, they're, they're doing great things with our technology, but again, we're providing the, you know, maybe a bad joke, but software plumbing for, for these providers, and uh, and pleasure to be here today, and uh, look forward to talking. Great, so, so thank you, uh, Galen, Vanessa, for, for having us here this evening. Um, talk us quickly, <coughs> and I'm the uh, Chief Executive Officer of Opti, and actually our headquarters is just across the uh, commons uh, by the Public Garden. Um, we're a two-year-old um, startup that has a much longer history. We were a spin-out of a consulting business um, where we are kind of a classic entrepreneurship story, where we created a company within a company, and then um, we're financed with uh, venture capital and private equity to create a new business, which is focused um, on, some, uh, on a very narrow market uh, that's relevant this evening. Um, the direct, real-time control, without humans in the loop, of stormwater infrastructure. Um, so we build intelligent systems that think on their own, on our behalf, um, with foresight about what's going to happen with the weather to minimize the impacts of the built environment on receiving waters. So we have, um, just to kind of give you an idea of what that looks like, in 21 states around the country right now, um, at over 130 different locations, 11 million gallons of storage are thinking on their own about minimizing the impacts of flooding, uh, water quality, <coughs> sewer overflow, and stream degradation through uh, flow rates. Um, this means there, there are literally 100,000 data streams of, of information from sensors, as well as the weather forecast information that is understood by all those systems, and they are essentially redesigning themselves minute by minute to minimize the impacts on the environment. So we, um, we are an Internet of Things company, but we don't talk about ourselves that way. Uh, we ultimately deliver outcomes, and I think we'll talk about this a little bit more. But um, the, the key thing for us is, uh, yes, we have uh, an incredibly interesting information uh, technology stack that wasn't really even able to be built five years ago. Um, but the, the outcomes are the thing that's most important to us. And we think, ultimately, uh, we don't just deliver information to people. Um, we'll hear a lot about Internet of Things, where the endpoint is people learning something. Um, what we do is we directly, our services directly act on improving the outcomes uh, in the environment, which is unique in the world right now. Um, and it's something that we think uh, uh, is how cities will look in, um, in uh, the next 30 years. Maybe I'm getting ahead on, uh, on the, where we're headed with segue. questions. But um, we have a really big vision, and uh, I encourage you to look at what we're doing and uh, I think where else similar approaches uh, can be applied.
And I'm John Sullivan. I'm the chief engineer of the Boston Water Sewer. I've been working at Boston Water Sewer for the past 44 years. Um, I graduated from UMass and I deal with Dave. <laughs> <laughs> we'll leave that alone. Um, and just so you know, not like uh, Sullivan's too much, but my father worked for the Water Department of the City for 40 years, <coughs> retiring as chief engineer. And my grandfather started in 1911, and he retired in 1962 as the chief engineer of the Water Department. Wow. <laughs> so there are a lot of plans on file. <laughs> uh, a couple of strange things about it's not a very common name. First, yeah. you know, <laughs> strange things about, about the city. First of all, we buy our water from MWRA, Massachusetts Water Resource Authority. We don't do any treatment. We don't do any pumping. So this water energy nexus is foreign to us. It comes down by gravity. This is the best thing in the world because the smartest people in the world built this system. <laughs> Remember, the biggest problems are solved by the smart people. And back in the 1800s, the biggest problem was clean, fresh water and, and sewage. So the smartest people took care of that problem. And I guess then they leave it to us, the dopes, a little bit down on the chain, <laughs> to maintain it. We have a very old system. We have a thousand miles of water pipe. Irrespective of the water main break yesterday, we have the lowest break frequency in the nation of large cities. On average, for a thousand miles of pipe, you should expect 270 water main failures a year. This year, as of yesterday, we hit 30. Our pipes date back to 1848, the pipe that feeds the frog pond is the original pipe put in when the public water system came in. We took the pipe apart in the 80s, we rehabbed it, that will last another 100 to 200 years based on the analysis we've done. We have studied our system inside and out. Our idea is we paid for a hole in the ground, we want to keep it going as long as possible. So we do all kinds of studies, every single segment of our water pipe system has an expected life left to it. That's how we do our analysis. That's why we don't have a lot of breaks, because when we know one is probably going to break, we take it out. And this isn't high-tech genius stuff, this is the basic stuff. But what we are looking for, and we keep working towards, is technology to keep telling us what's happening to these assets that are laying there doing nothing but corroding. Because that's what's happening to the iron pipe that wants to go back to what it was. So we have that issue. We have the issue of the water pressure, water quality. A lot of that is MWRA founded. We also do sewers, and that is the challenge and a half. You know, the whole Boston Harbor project and that. We, up to 1968, we took all the <coughs> sewers in downtown Boston and pumped it out to Long Island. That's 1968. That's when we stopped doing that. So the treatment is kind of new and novel to us, because when we were building in the 50s, nobody cared what they hooked up to. So we've had, we've removed over a thousand connections to storm drains where people every day simply flush their toilets and it went in the nearest pipe. If that happened to be a storm drain, that's what it was. Some of the technological things we're looking there is where we're going to be working with a company to pull uh, lines up the line and tell us where the illegal connections are, see where the change of temperature is. Because right now we have this labor intensive thing of knocking on your door asking us if we can put a little dye in the toilet to see if it shows up in the storm drain, <coughs> and then we send you a violation notice telling you to fix <laughs> So that works good for the first guy you grab. <laughs> so we're looking for all these different technologies on that. We, we are also very concerned with the climate adaptation. We just finished a big study, and we know the increasing rainfall. Since 96, when we got really flooded out, we've been collecting data at eight locations in the city which is a lot of location for a tiny area of 48 square miles. Uh, and we collect it in five minute increments. The reason we do that, and it costs a little more money, is because if it rains an inch in 15 minutes, you say, well, whatever. We're picking up in five minutes an inch of rain, which is total devastating to the system. A climate adaptation, we're not gonna dig up every single street to put new bigger pipes in. And you just can't. Downtown here, we have transit lines in the way. You know, the subways are built there, and the sewers are built on the side of the subway. You're not enlarging those things. So we're looking at both green infrastructure to hold the first inch. That doesn't help you when you get seven inches of rain. It does for the first inch, but... So we, we're looking at all that for the pollution portion of it. We're looking in the upland areas, the Arnold Arboretum and places like that, for flood storage. <coughs> and we need, we need, we're going to be needing some of the help, and I see how happy Marcus is. 
because <laughs> we'll, we'll need to hold it and release it and watch our systems because we cannot build necessarily a bigger environment. We need to control the water where we are. One of the biggest things we're worried about is could someone invent something to measure phosphorus for us? Because that's that magic thing that's causing all the problems. That's where we're spending millions and millions of dollars because we think it's in there. Because we took some grab samples. We need to find out really what's happening. Are the things we're building working? Are the things we're building, this whole green infrastructure, isn't like the good hardcore pipes. We know so much about pipes. Green infrastructure is we have a, a, a living environment going on, like the natural environment. But when is it getting clogged up? Are people cleaning them? Are they backing up? Are they working efficiently? We don't know any of this. We're building it because everyone else is building it and it sounds like a good idea. And we do know they'll last at least three years. <laughs> <laughs> but they're very expensive. And so we need to use technology to tell us when things are getting wrong. And if they're getting wrong, why? Why are they failing? So we have all these different things we're going on. One thing you should know, this is the one thing we've done so far, we were one of the first people to put in the smart technology of smart water meters. Now if you're in Boston, you should know that, and if we've got the new device in your house, that once an hour we read your water meter. And we collect the data, we send it to us in batches every four hours, and we plot it on our website so that you can control your own water use. So if you call us up and say, I, you charge me too much for water, we just remind you, you can control your own destiny of water. We also have the computer tell us when someone's water use goes up, we call you, which some people get very upset about, that we're monitoring your water and you've got a water leak. And so we're able to tell you ahead of time before we extricate all kinds of dollars from you that if there's something wrong in your home, your water use is up. Um, I, just a side story, my water was really strange going way up and down. We have just a few people and my mother-in-law used to live with me. I found out using our technology that my brother-in-law on Tuesdays and Thursdays was doing his wash at my house. <laughs> so there is value to this technology. The problem with the technology we find is the data points. We have all these data points coming in right now. Again, we don't pump. For what purpose? Well, the purpose we use it now is the billion. So I need one reading in January and I need one reading in February. I'm all done. But if we have a drought, and I tell you you can't use the water and you can't use this, I can monitor everybody's water use. So if we have a problem like that, if we have a, any particular issue, we have the capability of telling what's going on. The biggest advance we see is leak detection. Biggest problem, United States, aging infrastructure leaks. Try to find them. We have devices out right now monitoring all the North End and a lot of the financial district. They listen for the acoustical noise. We go by once a week, we pick it up, if two of the devices say I'm hearing noise, we go in and we check it out. There are better technologies, we're gonna be able to do this wirelessly and get this information of the right use of water. We need to manage our water supplies. We got plenty here in, in Massachusetts, but we still need to manage it. Mm -hmm. We need to manage it because if it leaks, guess where it goes? It goes into our sewer, guess what we get to do? We get to pay the MWRA. So we're looking at all the different technological things. We're working with a, a host of companies, several from um, Israel that are coming in because we want things that are pretty simple. We want to have to go there only once every six months to take a look at it, and we want the modular. Throw it away, put another one in, and cheap. Because we don't manufacture money, we take it from our ratepayers. <laughs> and so we have that burden also. So that, that's where we are on it. We have a ton of needs. And we're always looking for good solutions that, that, that fit our need. And if you fit our need, by the way, you tell the rest of the United States and they buy it too. So that's a good deal. Great. Thank you, John. That was, that was wonderful. So um, I think I'd like to change it up a little bit. In a lot of panels you hear the last question is, well, where do you think this industry will be in 30 years? And I, I think I'd actually rather ask that right up front. And John, you were starting to give us a preview of, of some of the things that you'd like to see um, in the Boston system. <laughs> Um, so actually, why don't we just begin with you, Marcus, and we'll, perhaps we'll circle back. Um, but just think about the future. Imagine you wake up in 2030, 2040, 2050. Um, what does a smart water city like Boston look like? I, I think um, you know, we, we have a vision of what we're building, um, and we, we think this is where kind of, uh, cities are headed in general. Um, and uh, I, I alluded to it uh, in the introductory remarks, but um, we really think cities should just work. Um, you know the what I expect, uh, and this isn't this isn't just about water. 
Um, it's about uh, how you use information and embed it in the services that you get on a continuous basis from a city. So um, the, the, the analog I would, uh, actually it's, it's a personal one, but um, that, uh, that, that I use, yeah, I take the green line every morning. And uh, there are great apps that tell you exactly when the train shows up. And um, you know, at first I thought, okay, this is really great. I can plan my life I'm looking at my, at my uh, phone and, um, and make sure that I'm there and I don't waste any time. I leave the house at the right point of time. And um, I think I came to realize, so you start using these things, right? And you've added a new like, cognitive load to your life. Um, you, you have to ingest more information and then you've got to decide what to do with that. And, um, and it seems like, uh, you know, this is particularly when they're new in your life, these are things that are helpful. You know, we, we found this with smartphones and technologies. But you come to realize, like, this isn't actually the city you want to live in. Um, you don't want to live in a city that uh, um, you are having to change the way you interact and take on a cognitive load to get the outcomes that you expect. Um, what I think we really should strive for, and I certainly hope um, the, the, maybe I'm looking at 50 years, but um, 30 would be nice, is that uh, the T actually shows up when I get there. Like that they actually use all of the information about how people arrive and where they want to go so that I get services that are incredibly responsive to what I expect out of the city. And I think the same is true of water and um, environmental impacts uh, of, of what we, you know, we're, we're focused on um, kind of the, the downstream side of urban environments, not as much on the water supply side. So I think we should be, expect to build um, cities that are thinking and acting on their own on our behalf without us even looking at the data. You know, the data is an intermediary step from our perspective for machines to talk to each other. It is not something that uh, should be introducing more cognitive load to people to figure out how to deal with all this complexity. It's been said, I think, by many that cities are the most complex things man has ever built. And, um, and the water systems and, and the associated power systems um, and services are some of the most complex systems uh, of those um, of those larger you know, uh, uh, systems. So um, I think we should expect the same thing out of our water systems: is that we get clean water of the quality that we expect. Uh, you know, radical transparency around quality. I think is going to transform the decisions we make and how we invest, um, how we uh, control and, and focus on where we improve our cities. Um, and, but that information shouldn't just come back to us. Uh, it, should be, it should be built in. And, uh, and technology really has the potential to do that, to integrate the information and get outcomes. And I think that's what we should all expect and drive for it. Scott, do you want to share your perspective? Sure, and, and maybe I'll, I'll put the qualifier that you know, I work for a software company and we, I just never really had much opportunity or been asked to look 30 years out. <laughs> so we, we deal with a little bit, I'm, as many businesses do, but uh, not uh, in the 30 year horizon. So I'm gonna maybe rein that in if that's okay a little bit. So you know, maybe five, 10 years, you know, some of the things that I see coming that you know, we get a little bit involved in. And maybe start with, uh, you know, well, the, the first would be, I think, a much more pragmatic, practical one, which is a much more, you know, lots of sensors, lots of actuators, you know, in, in a much more distributed fashion, so that, you know, there is a little bit more control over the existing infrastructure. It's hopefully not going to change, right? It's hopefully the same infrastructure. It's just not feasible to replace it all. Um, so I think that will happen. You'll have a lot more distributed, you know, whether that is, uh, you know, recovery systems for, for uh, gray water, you know, all, all those types of uh, potential ways in which we can you know, increase or decrease our usage of uh, clean, potable water we use and, and reclaim water and use it intelligently. So I think that's you know, probably not that far off, uh, certainly not 30 years. You know, one technology, and uh, you know, I talked very quickly with Marcus about this, we're, we're big on it in my company. I, I saved you the explanation of what an IoT platform is. I think everyone probably has their own definition. Uh, but we would say that one of the, the, the real fun elements of IoT, right, is that everyone today traditionally you know, designed for a web page or mobile app, 
and you're receiving digital information on that, you're you know making some improved decision or you know getting some new you know piece of information or service that you previously didn't get. And one of just the intuitive, exciting things is what if we could take all of that same infrastructure to develop and deliver that information and deliver it in kind of this augmented reality experience. And it's really not that far. There are a few things that need to happen to bring it into, into solutions in the industry. Um, so maybe go through a couple for water. Um, you know, a, one that will take some time, but you, know, you can throw sensors through your water pipes. You can discover where they are. You may not know where they are, but once you get that plot, you can then, in a, you know, either through a tablet or eyewear, just simply look over a street to identify where your operational water pipes are or your other utilities. And that's of high value, I think, to certainly uh, people who are doing construction in streets. It's not always you known. Um, so there's some real uh, nice things there. There are things like if you have a meter, you may not need to put an interface anymore. You could just put some sort of marker. There's a digital you know, unique ID. You show it on your tablet or your phone that everyone has. It's just a cost savings mechanism. Right? So there's all these ways that we can deliver you know, information through <laughs> augmented reality or through a mobile app. But the real benefit of augmented reality to maybe, uh, I agree really you know, with a lot that you know, Marcus was saying, we, there's uh, too much information being you know, thrown at people. And it's a nice way in the future. You know, if we have all this digital content that has all this potential for us to consume it, you know, we can use the analytics to try and make, drive some, some reasoning and, and you know, sort of thin out this large data stream as it gets to people. But augmented reality, really visually delivering that information, makes it a very consumable uh, mechanism. And I think people are much more accustomed and you know, uh, enjoy just sort of receiving that, that content in that way. And it will vary a lot by application to application, but I would expect that to, uh, to be in the future. Great. Dave, what about you the technology? Yeah, side? OK. So I guess um, I'd like to suspend reality, I guess, for a moment. Uh, we're really good at that at the university. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, we're all bound by the laws of physics, and um, we're not even the Sullivan family. <laughs> Why yeah. the laws of physics? <laughs> um, and so, thinking about where we're going with water and energy, uh, one of the things that I think actually is one of the early Sullivans who discovered that water flows downhill, right? And, um, and so, it takes energy to push water uphill. Uh, enormous amounts of energy, in fact. It also takes a lot of energy, and that's, that's moving water around. I mean, even, even on, on a level, uh, level ground, you still have frictional losses. So it takes a lot of energy. And if you're trying to change water quality, uh, it takes a lot of energy to get salts out of water, too. Sodium chloride. Uh, maybe not as much to get um, organic contaminants or pathogens. Uh, because you can break them up a little bit. You don't have to get them out completely. Um, and so thinking of all that and where would we go, and maybe not necessarily in Boston, because we'd have to go far, far into the future, you know, way maybe 50 years, but thinking about maybe creating new megacities around the world, uh, how would you design them to make the best use of uh, the technology that we have, recognizing that we're bound by the laws of physics? And one is you would always try to make sure that you don't pump if you can avoid it. You pump water, uh, you let it go by gravity. Uh, you try to avoid having to desalinate the water uh, unless you absolutely have to, uh, because that's really expensive and there, there, there are limits to how much you can do there without spending a lot of energy and money. Um, and so that leads us to, uh, to separate uh, water systems, perhaps, uh, because you know, the water systems that we have in the US were mostly designed around fire flows. Uh, and um, you had to fight large fires and a certain number of fires at, a, at the same time. And so you've got these large pipes to deliver water. Uh, they, uh, the average person, I don't know what the, the typical value for Boston is, but around the world, around the nations, maybe we use about 120 gallons per capita per day, per person per day, let's say in the city, um, well, how much of that do you actually drink? Well, no one drinks 120 gallons of water a day, but you might drink you know, half a gallon. And so what about the other 99%? Well, that goes to flushing toilets, uh, washing your car, maybe watering the lawns, all these other sources. So do we really need uh, to invest all this energy and money 
into bringing the water to the quality that we demand for drinking purposes mm -hmm. when we're not using most of it for drinking purposes. Mm -hmm. uh, and so there's a lot of things that we would do differently maybe in, a developing, in the developing world and design systems in a different way. And where I'm going ultimately, I think, is, is separate systems uh, uh, for, for drinking and for other purposes, perhaps, and maybe many separate systems. Um, maybe decentralized water, where the, the central supply is just maybe that, and a little bit of treatment, clean it up a bit, but then you rely on uh, decentralized polishing uh, for for cleaning a little bit of water that we do drink or, or the water that needs especially high quality for whatever purpose. Uh, and so all those, I think, will help us get around some of these problems that, that we're dealing with. But of course, that's, um, that doesn't deal with the immediate issue. Well, I, I think one of the problems is that's the panacea for the new city. So after we burn a few more down, we can build new ones. <laughs> we live in cities, and we have it. Uh, in 1976, we bought 151 million gallons a day here in the city. Last year, we bought 62 million. Now, everyone says, that's great, we're saving all the water. The problem is, is the pipes are real big, and we gotta make sure that water moves and doesn't age and has a chlorine residual and is, meets public health. So that's another challenge that we need to do. So as we replace them, we don't always replace them as big as they need to. The good news is to rehab them. We can pull smaller pipes through them. We save money. These are all the things existing, because the United States is gonna stay the same. I think one of the things we're all missing, because we're lucky in this end of town, over California, you're going to flush it, and you better hope that polisher works because they're going to have direct reuse because they have a certain volume of water. And their issue, and that's going to come sooner than you think, they have a real issue about really managing water. And they don't have the time to put the dual systems in. The pipes are built. It's so much money for the built environment, you can't really afford it. You can't afford the technology to clean up your wastewater and everything. So I see that happening in the short term, and then in the, in the very long term, it depends on the climate change. Because they've got to be careful, because they may just be desalinate water, or we're all going to move to Cleveland, because it's the Great Lakes. <laughs> That's an option. I didn't say it was a good one. <laughs> so you both talked about, um, you both mentioned that there's, a, there's potentially an opportunity to downsize. And of course, we, you know, there's another grid, right, that is oversized, and uh, we use only about, um, uh, we use 30% uh, of it, only 10% of the year, and of course that's our electric grid, also oversized, built in a different era. Uh, and uh, so it just occurs to me that there is this, uh, and within the electricity, uh, within the energy realm, uh, we're moving to a distributed future, right? We're seeing more and more distributed energy resources, whether they be fossil fuel based or renewable. Um, so I'm wondering if we could kind of um, react a bit, um, kind of rapid fire and, and get this a little bit more interactive um, on this, kind of this key scale question, right? We've got uh, a legacy system which functions very well, again. Um, wonderful water quality here. Uh, but there may be opportunities to go smaller scale in the same way that our energy system is beginning. We're looking at microgrids, we're looking at, uh, again, distributed energy resources. Uh, how do you see that spilling over into um, the water realm? Do you think we'll see more distributed um, systems? Uh, both on the um, the wastewater, the gray water side, uh, and what are the what are the, some of the challenges there? Just kind of quick reactions to that. Mm -hmm. Well, I think in building based systems and at that scale, we're doing it already in places with some buildings and, and uh, dual systems there. Um, of course, we're doing it with point of use treatment devices in our homes. You have little <coughs> filters on, uh, on your taps, or maybe a point of entry in your home. So yeah, it's happening to some extent. Yeah, there's a, I mean, there's a direct analog to energy. Um, uh, there are uh, obviously distributed energy systems being built all over now um, for uh, for power generation, and I, I think there are good analogs in um, in water. Um, the the critical thing, though, is a lot about what we're talking about tonight is the ability to use distributed assets in a collective way. Um, so it's it's always been the case that we can build kind of small scale systems. But the question is, can all those things work together to achieve a goal? Um, for example, uh, even with uh, with green infrastructure, which you know, Boston is uh, is um, heading down that path, um, using the, all of those components uh, in an effective way in a city is a challenging thing. Figuring out um, how uh, maintenance is being carried out and whether those things function, 
how do you uh, how do you observe and maintain and operate thousands of things instead of you know tens or hundreds of things. Um, the but the, the information uh, technology layer is really a, a bridge to I think um, in the same way it is in the power grid um, to, to using those distributed assets uh, very effectively. And there there's a complete analog in what we do to um, distributed uh, power storage. Um, you know, where you, you have batteries all over and uh, you generate power and then you decide when to feed it back to the grid based on what demand looks like, which is kind of a hot thing, right, in, uh, in, uh, in the power side. Um, water is very similar. I mean, um, uh, storage of any sort, a, a tank, a large pipe, is, um, is really a place to deal with timing issues. So um, what we essentially do in stormwater is we, uh, we tweak the timing of discharges in order to achieve downstream goals. So we really, we really use these um, storage assets in the exact same way that you would use on a distributed uh, grid uh, power. Um, and at this point, you're doing that at the building parcel level? Uh, at the building level, some of them are regional, though, too. Um, like the largest facilities are, I mean, acre feet, um, 13, 14 acre feet or some of our larger components uh, and um, you know there's, there's a large stormwater structure so you can dealing with entire subdivisions or industrial complexes that uh, that you know effectively discharge to a single point and then you're making a decision about the timing of the discharges to the rest of the system whether it's sending it into a combined system uh, where the wastewater treatment uh, plant is ultimately going to have to deal with it or you're sending it into a stream or into a system that might flood um, so there's uh, there's really this ability to, to deal with distributed assets in unique ways do you see an opportunity, John, to kind of transition from that, from the, the system that we have in Boston, uh, uh, to uh, perhaps there's a hybrid approach or a slow transition? I know that a lot of buildings, for example, have to capture and, and detain a certain, the first inch, if you will. And if you begin to aggregate the impacts of um, deploying you know, Marcus's technology in, a, in an area that might be prone to flooding or, or is in a CSO, combined sewer outfall, would you begin to see impacts, and how might that how might that be incorporated into what you're doing? Well, in our in our climate change, if the rainfall continues the way it does, the patterns are very strange. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the problem is everyone says, "What's the trend?" Well, you can't have a trend when you get three or four years of data. You need data. Um, so, a couple of things we've been looking at, and you know, downtown, what we're going to do, sea level rise and all that, you can't get the water out. We're looking at all these fantastic parking garages they're building under all these luxury condos. Mm -hmm. <coughs> we may take easements and we'll own that space when it's raining out. You get the cars out of there, we'll pre-build pumps in there, and we'll use all these parking garages as storage capacities for those unusual storms so we don't build gigantic tunnels at multi-million dollars, which by the way, we'll take your money. We won't do that. We'll just pay an easement, pre-build the pump out, fill the things up, pump the thing out, scour it down, <coughs> And wait for the next big storms. So you got to be a little more innovative of where you have all the parts. And we're already looking at garages. We don't tell the owners yet, <laughs> but we're looking. At and then that's downtown. And then upstream, we've got all these glorious places out in West Roxbury and Hyde Park. And there's tons of opportunity for us to do two things: one, try to remove the phosphorus before it gets downstream to the Charles River, and naturally build wetlands. And at the same time, when we build that wetland, build it high enough that we have a sluice gate, we could shut that thing down in whole water. And we will be starting next year, peeking around. The reason we need to look at it now, although we may not build them right away, you can't let anybody else build on them. The last thing we want to do is lose the opportunity to secure land. And, and we're looking at other places where there's certain homes that flood a lot. It may be cheaper to buy the house than it is to build a concrete system to prevent the problem. So these are all the things we're looking at. It we talked a lot about the information and the infrastructure, and devolving, distributing. Um, how are you going to develop the smart people to use the smart water in the smart city? I mean, our, our vision is that people don't need to know about the technology. I mean, the direction the direction we're headed is that the people get what they want, and they don't know any of the data. They don't need any of the information, um, and they get the get the outcome. But they have to I be smart enough to trust. They have to trust. Trust is the critical thing mm -hmm. for all of these technologies, and, and I, I don't disagree at all. I, I wonder, you know, I, I don't know if, uh, 
in the energy market, right? So I think there it's a little bit, people have gamified it, right? Or at least prefer themselves personally. You know, how much can I not use, consume from the grid? Can I you know, use from solar? Can I store it in my car? You know, so I think there is the opportunity. I agree entirely, you, you should not require anyone to, to push, uh, to, to learn anything, but I think there is still the opportunity that people do ultimately want to, uh, you know, be someone, or there's a group of people who want to conserve water and, you know, I think we, we should foster that if, if they're interested. And unfortunately, we didn't have time to get into that tonight, but Marcus and I have had great conversations about markets, you know, in the same way that renewable portfolio standards help accelerate explosion of, of clean energy, perhaps there's opportunities for markets, particularly on the stormwater side, that we do the same. Yes, you. Yes. You mentioned California and the mess that they're in. Can you just amplify each of you on what they need to do? I mean, we know what the problem is, right? Right. But um, <clears throat> what, what I see them, and they're very actively doing it, is desalination plants, but the reuse is tremendous over there, of reusing the water, treating it, taking it right from the treatment plants, finding a way to reuse it, and because and, it's a quantity issue. It's a quantity of, of vapor they have that they need to use. And so that's where they're going, and they're going to just be there. So it's just a, a recycling. <coughs> recycling in their little built environment with their amount of, then they'll have to import some more because they'll make it up for evaporation. But there's got to be a lot of reuse. There are big cultural changes that are really important. When you look at water use, for example, in LA, the quantity that's used for irrigation um, is really significant. I mean, as, as was mentioned by uh, um, Dave, is you know, the, the amount that's used for drinking um, is, is min minuscule compared to, um, even in L LA, you can look at, uh, you know, the wealthiest communities use the most water and they use it to water plants. I mean, essentially, and they're not willing. I mean, LA has not gotten to the point where they're willing to change their entire landscape to look like Phoenix. And um, they, they, actually have, they actually have plenty of water. They just have to decide how to use it. They haven't, they haven't made those hard choices, and you, they haven't gotten to the point where they've had to. Yes? Are there any incentives to replace chlorination with other technologies or other treatment in the future? And if yes, what could be alternatives? Well, the chlorination that used to be done for the treatment processes has largely been ozonation is being used with ultraviolet, and that's what we use in Boston. But then when we send the water down through the piping system, you've got to have some kind of disinfectant in there. So we do use a little chlorine. So in general, in the MWRA system, you're just using the chlorine for residual disinfectant. The chlorination or the disinfection is ozonation and ultraviolet is the backup. But if you look around the world, you find uh, cities that don't use chlorine at all. Yeah. And, they, and there aren't widespread deaths from pathogens. And so it may come down to design the right. system. And if we can do a smarter job with new cities, uh, maybe the old one, the legacy uh, cities are, are more difficult to deal with. But the new ones, uh, you know, I think we can we can get around the chlorine problem. Yes. yes. Um, I've been involved with um, education programs in developing countries, and I I know Dave is doing work in that in that realm. But uh, as far as looking at, I mean, I'm not worried anymore with, now that we know the pragmatic gentleman down on the left there taking care of Boston. Um, I think we're okay here, except for that outflow pipe. I have to ask you about. It. I live in the situation. Um, but um, if, you guys, if you guys could, if you guys could uh, just maybe comment on some work you might be doing or thinking about other markets. I'm in Central Africa right now. Doing some work. Uh, my organization, we make an IoT platform, right? and it is you know, broadly used in across different markets. You know, we're a global company. You know, we have plenty of projects going on inside of. Uh, Middle East and Africa. More in the Middle East, I you know I can see the the large kind of Dubai projects. Maybe less around water, more around uh, oddly. I mean, it's also obviously uh, water limited, um, but you know a lot more with just sort of energy and you know efficiencies of large building spaces. Um, but we we're you know we're global and we're definitely pursuing all markets. One one of the interesting things about the developing world is. Um, yeah, that there's this analog to what's happened with communications infrastructure. That they've been able to leapfrog over, you know, a whole set of generations of technologies and go directly to cell phones. I mean, everybody's heard that story, right? Um, and, I, and I think um, in uh, civil infrastructure and, uh, and in water supply, there are opportunities to do that as well. 
um, and uh, it, it, it takes some you know thoughtful design and, and uh, foresight to do that but there there are places that will you know kind of bypass all of the maybe it's the places that uh, Dave described I mean these these cities that will be built from whole cloth or large portions of cities that will build from whole cloth and they have they have an opportunity to do this I mean China is doing this right now what Dave described is building cities that they're trying to use these types of design principles to minimize the um, the uh, environmental impact and to minimize energy use if nothing else to save money as part of the, uh, the long-term uh, you know uh, operation and maintenance of those, those places but um, it's a pretty exciting opportunity I think long term places so. like Mazdar and cities like that that are kind of taken just from scratch mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, I hear uh, a, a good picture of what can be done to uh, manage legacy systems intelligently and <laughs> apply uh, computer based uh, controls to that process I'm wondering if anyone could identify other areas where a small company might make a significant technological contribution and really move things forward. Is there some area of chemistry? Is there some area of sensors? Is there something other than those areas where a small company might make a big impact? Well, uh, uh, right. What do you say? Phosphorus. Phosphorus. Yeah. Phosphorus. 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 The whole MS4 across the country, all the new regulations on stormwater for nutrients. We can't measure them well. We, 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 we take a couple of grab samples and spend millions of dollars trying to fix what we had that one day. And we, nitrate is the other one. Nitrate is the other one. Yeah. And let, and me add, let me add lead to that. So lead, lead, they've been on a good probe for lead. Right. Um, we, uh, we, we are so we're seeing lots of developments yeah. in sensor technology. Mm -hmm. And um, it's tough as it may be a, a, a small company um, unless you've got the killer technology, right? But, um, but the, you know, the uh, $100 nitrate probe that could last in the environment for a year, which isn't a huge amount of time, would um, you know be a, a billion or more dollar product, and uh, and there's really nobody that has even come close to that. It's, it's robust. So. I, I maybe just add, and this is less uh, you know maybe uh, you know sort of innovative in terms of really the pure science side of it, but you know we work with a lot of organizations that are developing niche solutions that are, you know, this is kind of a new time, right? And, you know, in, whether it's in managing irrigation of a golf course, managing, you know, farm-based, I mean, so really impactful potential ways to conserve water, <coughs> but also just to make a, a, a real value prop to, uh, to, a, to an end, you know, uh, customer. And it's the small companies that know this space that, you know, are leveraging the sort of collection of technologies that exist in the market that are delivering the innovation. And I think there's a lot of room for them to, uh, to you know, to have their technology be sort of the chosen one that uh, you know, has success. Yeah, the number of, so you've got horizontal companies like PTC yeah. that have their infrastructure companies for IoT. But like we picked one vertical, one very narrow vertical, IoT for stormwater. I mean, how narrow is that? It's a, it's a $100 billion market, but it's a, it's a very narrow market. Um, and there are literally thousands of other niche markets mm -hmm. where what you want to do is you want to build a vertical for that specific market, pick one that's large, and robust and you know is resilient and then uh, you know make sure that you're the absolute expert on that subject and um, and deliver a solution in context with IOT and uh, and utilize all the these services that are available to build it and um, I mean it's like uh, it's like it's 1990 and you just learned about the internet or something and yeah. you ask the question like well what do I do with the internet and um, and it's it's like okay you build a company on the internet I mean, there are, there are many business models that have never been tested, and there are probably far more with uh, IoT just because they're physical things. And maybe I'll throw out one more kind of exciting thing that we see is there are a lot of organizations that are sort of the prime vendor working with cities, and you know, they have the relationships, but they don't have the technology, right? right? And they want to discover, they want to make the connection with a small company that has done something, has 10 customers, 15, you know, there's some proof, and then they want to be the partner to go sell, resell, OEM to whatever, you know, to bring that technology to market. So it's a nice space, I think, cities, utilities, because you have, uh, there are large organizations that are, are starving for the, those kind of innovations. Open innovation. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. yes, you in the back. Yes. Um, so my question is to, well, to both PTC and to Boston Water. Um, 
and it'll get in the middle. So, we, so we're creating a device that will actually detect leaks inside toilets, which account for a huge part of the water bill. Um, so it is actually sort of a very narrow vertical in terms of what it does, but the impact is huge. The only problem that I see is that it takes the person out of the loop of actually caring about anything. And so once again, are we also enabling people to care less about things I mean, we're making it a better place by by letting people use less water, but are we making them care less about everything as well? Well, I, I don't think so, because number one, that impacts the air pocketbook. Um, you know, the toilet leaks are tremendous what they do to someone's water bill. And if you can get a device to help them know ahead of time how they can control their run, they're, they're going to pay attention to this device. Not the, not the people who live in the buildings. The person who pays the bill will. Yeah. But the people who live Rent in the buildings are part of yet another Rent reason to care about things. Well, I think a lot of people aren't caring about a lot of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> you know, my, uh, believe me, all, all my kids do is text message about me when I'm sitting in the living room. And they're all giggling. <laughs> so I mean, what are, you know, what's going on here? This is, we're just in a whole new environment. I, I hear what you're saying, but I think it's a good thing we can save water in the places that are water stopped. Like it upsets stuff. me a lot because we make revenue off of leaky toilets. <laughs> but uh, whatever. Yeah, there, there is the opportunity to use um, kind of social norms. Like there have been, there have been uh, good examples of this in society. I mean, one is like seatbelts. Um, that it's uh, like socially unacceptable anymore to ride in a car without your seatbelt on. Yes. And there was a big, I mean, when I was a kid, well, pff, nobody thought of that, right? I mean, mm -hmm. it's, it, the social norm has changed. Um, the exposure of information that can um, lead to social norms around these types of behavior. I mean, you know, paying the water bill, I think most people pay their water bill. I mean, they get alarmed if it's really high. But if they have a small leak in their toilet or at least for a while, they pay the thing, they don't know what happened. Uh, they're pretty disconnected. Uh, there, there's the opportunity to reconnect people and then to introduce social norms around behavior. If you really want to change water usage, I think that's what you've got to do. So um, one idea with that is um, it's actually it was pioneered by uh, the MIT Media Lab. Is that a plug for MIT? <laughs> um, but uh, but uh, ambient, ambient information systems, which is to take the information that you have and use it in a way, someone's environment, that it potentially exposes them to other people's perspectives in this social, like normative environment in a way that makes them aware. So like, if your kid knows um, you're not wearing a seatbelt, they're gonna say like, hey, you gotta put your seatbelt on, Dad. But um, if, you know, if you know that you're intentionally wasting water in a way that doesn't require any cognitive load, now your kids are talking about it, your neighbor might come over and say like, hey, you know you're wasting water. People, these are things that are visible, so I would say make them visible. Yeah, um, yeah this is interesting. I think one of the things we often talk about is to that point, sort of the end user. I think on the other side, we brought up uh, decentralized systems, but that in itself has an impact on utility, on utility revenues and their use of water in their pocketbook. And so if their pocketbook and their revenues go down, then they can't invest in the infrastructure that they already have, or it's potentially being underutilized. Because what we've seen in the power sector is with solar panels, and they're being installed on roofs, and next thing you know, whether it be Duke Energy or PSEG said, actually, we, maybe we want to start looking at this. So do we see any business model shifts on the utility side of, of the spectrum while, you know, Maybe they're, I don't want to say they're competing with the Veolia as the service providers, but how is that going to evolve? Do you guys see that evolving over time going forward? Because at the end of the day, or, you know, it's a matter of taking advantage of underutilized assets or redeploying assets and capital to manage the system more efficiently. If, if, I don't know if you guys have any thoughts on that. Well, in the, in the built city, we don't see this really happening. But if I were in an area with like outposts and people wanted to develop industrial parks and then turn them into a place where a bunch of people were going to live and they'd be a decentralized, don't forget, it's not cheap running these small decentralized stations right. and the regulations that go with them and everything else. So it's, it's an economic competitive advantage. So we need to be more competitive. The problem is the infrastructure in the United States for running a water sewer system, the pipes are, outweigh everything. It's 90% of everything we do is all in the pipe. And once we can't sell the water, 
What we do is really innovative. We change the unit charge. So we charge you more <laughs> right. for the less you use. Exactly. Um, it will get to a point, but that's what's happening everywhere. Happen. The unit prices are going up because everyone's being efficient. We're putting in efficiency units. And unless you're saving money by not building a reservoir, people can't comprehend this. Very difficult. So that, that, I mean, that, that doesn't incentivize utilities to ultimately drive conservation. Right. Because it's, it's like uh, they've got fixed costs. Yeah. Huge fixed costs. Well, I want to I respect everyone's time. I know there are some folks who had some additional questions, and I would encourage you to, to um, speak with the panelists. But I want to thank this wonderful panel. <laughs>